Tonight, I'm just going to go through um, a few things about me stupidly in 2015 saying to a sponsor for Chelsea Flower Show that I would actually do a garden at Chelsea Flower Show. And it was quite interesting because the remit from the actual sponsor who was Bruin Dolphin was can you please do something with chalk downland? Can you incorporate a fizzy drink, people? And we want it to be as natural as possible. And so when I got that through and I thought, well, chalk downland, that's what we live on. We've got the most amazing uh, chalk stream at the bottom of the river. And when you look at that, most people go, oh, fishing. And I thought, no, let's get away from that obvious thing. So basically, we live in a little uh, hamlet called Free Folk. And so we called the garden Forever Free Folk. And as you can see, chalk streams are our rainforest was basically my mantra for what we were going to do. So this is a little bit about me, a award-winning nursery person who's been growing herbaceous perennials on our site here at the top of uh, Priory Lane in Free Folk for, well, that says 26 years. It's now actually nearer 33, 34 years. And we probably did five years before we actually moved to this area. And then once we moved to the area of Free Folk and Laverstoke, we thoroughly enjoyed the area. We love the nature, we love the countryside, and we, we adore the test. So basically what happened was I was asked by Bruin Dolphin to do this display and it was very short notice. Basically, they asked me when all of the um, closure had been done for actually applying to do a research. They said, oh, well, don't worry about that. We've already got the spot. RHS have told us we've got the spot. So I put in against five other people and decided that actually the key thing of this area was the river test, was the fact that it's chalk downland and how it all integrates with everything else that is nature around us. So that was really where we went from. So we thought, right, well, what has the river been used for over all of these years? And the main thing is there are so many mills on the river. All of these mills are different. Um, but they all had one thing in common. They were all going downstream from this beautiful river. And this river has been used since the Roman times. And I did a lot of research going back and forth, finding out what the river had, why the river was flowing so well, what has made it such a successful river. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that it actually has been managed and it's been managed quite well. And you will find in any of these chalk streams that they have been dammed in places. They've been made to flow quicker in places. They've been made to have numerous little offlets going through so that it's not quite as fast going through in one area. There are all of the different ways that it can be utilized. Yes, it was a natural river to start off with, but it has been kept going and kept flowing. And I know very well, because I have a friend in um, Suffolk, and she had me go up to see them when they were doing their work on the Lark and the Linnet. And if you go up there and look at those rivers, they look nothing like our chalk streams. They're no longer clear. They have got farming residue, they've got rubbish in them, they are silted up to the nth degree because they've not been managed in the way that our beautiful streams have been managed. And a lot of people don't understand this. So this was all the things behind what I was doing. So this was the presentation that we put to Bruin Dolphin to get them to accept us to do the garden that we wanted to do. And the fact that I love all the countryside that is around me. Now I am new to Hampshire. Okay, we've been here for 30 years. I don't actually originate from this area. I originate from Northumberland. And we don't have chalk streams in Northumberland. We have beautiful big rivers, but I still love water. And I think that as soon as you see 
water flowing it just gives you that calming influence you see the insects going through you see the fish they can be different i was brought up on the river Tyne. we had the salmon coming through we had them leaping and you know and it was lovely it, it was a lovely water to be on this is a lovely water to be on so you know you've really got to do it so i produced various displays I've done all sorts of things got gold medals everything else but everything comes back to the fact that we live in an area where I can grow material and it can be done and we have to remember that the chalk streams that are globally there there is something like 220 in the world 80 percent of those are in the UK and of those very few are looked after properly and they are vital to our water supply. They are vital to a lot of our insects. So I knew you may have heard this before, but this was my passion. This was what I was trying to get through when I was doing the design. So the client brief was basically this, that a Bruin Dolphin are a company. Yes, they are a company that is in the city. They are to do with people investing money. A lot of people may not like that. But at the end of the day, if people invest, then you might get something back out of it. They were founded in 1962. Well, in 1950s, 19, uh, sorry, 1760s, 1750s, the Huguenots left France in their droves and they came over to this country and it is because of them the river test has a lot of its paper industry they came over to do that and one of the families that came in came in and they went to Bear Mill which is just down the road from here and that's where a lot of my design work came from was going to Bear Mill looking at that mill it was set up at that time the people that came over so you're talking 250 years ago plus they came over and they thought, oh gosh, this water is really clear. It's going to be great for us to make paper. And they also understood that, you know, the natural resource was something they needed to look after. And so they made sure that the water courses that they used, they only used part of it. And then they put the rest of the water down the side in, in these extra pieces. The beauty of our water was that they were able to put watermarks onto paper. And that is where banknotes got all of their watermarks from. And so what you have to remember is that you've got this wonderful gin clear water going through. So these are all local photographs that you can see that I've got here. So it is clear water. It is shallow in places. It's wide in places. It's narrow in places. And, you know, they are fantastic and special places for people to go. But they are managed. You know, they are looked after. So you've got things like this. This is just down at Free Folk. And actually, I have to say, that is very high. If you were to go down to that particular spot at the moment, I have never seen the water while I've been here for 30 years as low as it is at the moment. Now, what we have to remember, people say the chalk streams are our rainforests. And yes, that is absolutely true. Why? Because the water falls on the chalk downland. It filters through the chalk. The chalk then create, you know, the water then comes back up and it comes out clear. It is absolutely beautiful. It is mineral rich. It is a constant temperature. This is something people don't understand. Even in the winter, the temperature of the water is somewhere between 10 and 12 degrees centigrade. People used to put buildings over the top of the river to keep those buildings warm in the winter and they wouldn't freeze because the water was so warm. So they were able to keep all sorts of um, materials in there and keep them cool or, or, you know, warmer than they would have been outside. And this is something that is really interesting. So the geology of chalk means that it is cool. You get these lovely habitats, you get all of this thing. And, you know, our chalk aquifers are under threat because people are extracting and they are extracting water quicker than water filtrates through and this is what I needed to explain to people 
So if you get rainfall and you get a lot of rainfall, everyone thinks, oh, great, we've had lots and lots of rain. That's great. We're going to, the rivers are going to fill up. No, the test is not filling up at that rate. It will take a minimum of six months for that rainwater to actually filtrate through the chalk. Most of the time, it can be two years. And people start thinking, really, it takes that long for water to get through? But for it to filtrate properly and to come through as our clear water, that's how long it takes. And we can extract thousands of litres of water in a day. We're only getting hundreds through in a day. And we need to preserve and be able to restore and strengthen everything for the future, for the future generations, and even for ourselves. Water is a vital resource, which we as a country have got to understand. So the River Test has been a vital for shaping all of our local industries. You know, it, it, the different mills have done different things. We've got paper mills, we've got silk mills, we've got grain mills, etc. So the Huguenots came over, they understood the quality and they made banknote paper for the Bank of England. And then they introduced all sorts of interesting things because even in those days, you're looking at the 1700s, they had people, you know, sort of cloning stuff and making it up. So they put in the woven silver that you see in the paper. They put in the watermarks, et cetera. And this was quite interesting to me. I thought, oh, that's a really key thing. Let's let's think about something weaving through. And so that went through with all the design. So what you can see at the bottom of these pictures here, you've got these brick and flint walls, which everybody knows of in, in the locality, but no brick and flint wall is the same. Flints are just part of the structure that comes with chalk because they are um, sponges or something like that, that silica ended up in. And when the ground sort of sunk and it all compressed, you got the chalk, you got the flint. So we have both. The bit at the end is the bit that we decided we loved the shape of. And these are little coccolithospheres. And they are microscopic, tiny little planktonic uh, skeletons that, you know, would have been in the seas millions of years ago. And they are part of chalk. There are plenty of other ones. There are ones which are spirals and all sorts of things. But these ones were the ones that caught our imagination because you can see water will filtrate through. And, you know, it's just something. And I thought, oh, no, I can make that into something in the garden. It can be a sanctuary and that sort of thing. So this is what I was utilising when the garden was first moted. And so the idea was that you would have a pathway that will walk through the beauty of Hampshire countryside, through all of the hazel coppices, the lovely planting and natural plants that you get underneath that. You'd have a beautiful, clear water source underneath that sanctuary. It would go into a lovely flowing river. The pathway would meander its way through like your silver threads, hanging everything together, and then suddenly it would drop off like dropping off a cliff and you would get to a barren wilderness of chalk and flint and dried out riverbed. And unfortunately, that is what a lot of the chalk streams around this country have become because people haven't looked after them. And this is what this was all about. So this is a story of your traveling through if no one does anything to resurrect, to help and actually love the chalk streams that we have got. So you will get it uh, metamorphosizing into all of these different things. So you get from the balance to the imbalance. And unfortunately, with our society and what we do with extracting water, that imbalance is what happens. And you've got your chalk, you've got your tiny little coccoliths, you've got your flints, you've got your beautiful river, you've got your pathway going through your woodland, and then security within your hub of your coccolithosphere, which is where your water is being filtered through. OK, it's microscopic, but it's been blown up to being a three metre by three metre sphere for people to shelter and keep going. So we're on a very 
ancient, laid down Cretaceous, 100 million years ago, formed by compacted plankton. You know, their skeletons are down there. They didn't live for nothing. You know, they have produced us beautiful water. As I say, there is dissolved silica, and that is what makes the flint. But it's an amazing product as well. So the, the idea is that you get a synergy between everything that is going on in the wildlife and everything else, and you will get to beautiful, clear water that sustains life. And H2O is a very important thing for us as humans and for a lot of the rest of the world to be able to survive. This is the general plan of what the garden was going to look like. I wanted to have your sort of natural um, hedging. So all of what we would expect to see around us, you know, the, the hazels, the euonymus, the hornbeams, everything else, that was something that I wanted to have in there. The trees were very important because while I was looking at the discovery of what was happening, in the 1700s, when the Huguenots came over, so did an ulnus, which was the cut-leafed ulnus. Now, if you want to see some very good cut-leafed ulnus, if you go to Bear Mill, they've been made into a hedge and they look absolutely fabulous. And then right at the front, uh, and later on you will see, there is a beautiful multi-stemmed um, malus, so i.e. an apple tree. All mills had orchards with apple trees growing in there, one for the apples and two for the apple wood because the spindles of the mills had apple wood in them. And they were, if they needed to repair any of the small bits in the spindle, it needed to be applewood. And so they had it growing in their own gardens. In the, so it all tied in. And then some brick and flint walls as well. That was not going to happen. If anybody knows about putting up a brick and flint wall properly, you will know you put up three or four courses, you have to let it dry. This garden had to be built in 20 days. That was never going to happen. So we had to come along and use modern ideas of making a brick and flint wall. So we came up with a gabion idea. And then our stepping stones were gabions as well, filled with flints. I wanted the garden to be vibrant as well. So I wanted it to be able to be what people could do in their own garden. So we would, have, because obviously we grow herbaceous perennials, I'm someone who loves colour and wants to fit all sorts of colour together. So you come from the gentle of the actual wild into what the gardens would be. And the garden on one side would be beautiful and as a garden would be without us losing water. So i.e. it has plenty of rainfall, there is a plenty of water there, etc. One side of it, the other side of the river is where it would get a little bit more water, so it'd be damp loving plants. And then as you gradually move your way out and the water course is drawn away, so you get dry planting into arid. It's a journey of jeopardy. And it's a journey of discovery of what is going on and how you would look through and see what was happening. So in this process, we then had to do a little 3D model. Um, a girl that works for us is an architect and she just loves making models. So we had this model so that we could really work out how we were going to get the rise and fall and how the little gabions were going to work. And we had to find all sorts of little bits and pieces to make it up. And all of the gardens that are made at Chelsea have to be made to building regulation. So if you are putting in a walkway to be walked on or it is going to be accessible by wheelchair or disabled, you have to have it at the correct level. It has to be built to the correct. So, so all of this is where the pathway is going. So they had to dig down. And you can see with the little digger there how deep they went down. And then you can see with the actual metal girders that are going in, they are the supports for all of the raised walkway going right the way around. It started at ground level and then was raised right the way over the top to look as though it was floating. 
So this is a bit that people never see. They never see the amount of actual construction and actual hardware that goes into these things. Now, it does get recycled. Um, it doesn't get recycled to be being put back up again. This one was not a garden that was put back up. Bits went off to hospices. A lot of the stone went for you know, hardware, ground fill, and the metalwork was all recycled and sent off to being reused. So it did go back to being recycled because they have to be now. The plant material all got recycled as well, all got sold off. So this is where we said we were doing a brick and flint wall. No brick and flint wall is the same anywhere you go. If you go wandering around and look at the little walls that are around people's gardens, I asked someone about it because I thought, well, let, let's find out exactly what happens. They said, oh, no, we will have a few flints left over and we will make them. And then we find whatever broken bricks and everything and put them up. So you'll have random patterns. No one has the same pattern. So I thought, well, that's fine. So what I'll do with this big four meter high brick and flint uh, wall that we made within these gabions was that the pattern that we did with the actual brickwork was the same pattern as the river, the same pattern as the actual pathway. So it all tied in together. And I didn't want your standard gabions and I found some different ones. So these are slightly different gabion um, metalwork than you would normally see. And lots and lots of work to do all of this. And eventually you get it finished and you can see that the, the wall is finished. And you can see behind yet another garden going in there. And at this time, while all of this hardware is going on, the trees have started to be planted. So once all of that pathway is in, then we can get in and look at what we're doing. So there's the finished Gabion wall. And what you can see in the way of metalwork at the bottom here, this sort of circular round bit, that is the area to stop the water because that is now going to be the circular spring, the idea of the natural spring, that is going to be that area there. Unfortunately, we had a leak at one stage, never work with water. It always goes all over the place. It really, really does. We were suddenly we were going really great guns and we thought, oh, good, it's all flowing in the right direction. And then suddenly it stopped and you're thinking, where is it going? And we realized it was going over the back. So we had to lift the back and then we had to cut a bit at the front a little bit lower and get it to go the right direction. Water flows where it wants to flow. So it flows to the lowest point. If you haven't quite got your levels right and something has sunk, you have a problem. So that was something that happened with it. So this is the pathway you can see going through. The native hedging is all going in down the side. It's Acer Compestry, it is hazel, um, it's euonymus, it's all that sort of thing, because I wanted it to be as natural as to this type of plant material we would have in this area. And then coming down to the bottom corners, you can see the pathway, you can see how much of a tilt there is on it, and you can see the circle of what will be the um, water there. And then here comes our giant coccolithosphere, which is made out of aluminium. It's cast aluminium, and that is going to go on top of that and look as though it is floating over the top of the water and over the top of the pathway and just give a really impressive look. And then that had to be put together um, and it's all starting to make shape and becoming that finished article of the water filtrates through the chalk. It becomes a beautiful spring. It floats down the river. You can walk across it. You can see the beauty and then suddenly you get into things that are not going to work. When you're there and you are doing this type of um, garden and display, obviously you've got to have plants and you've got to have a load of plant material there. You've got to fill it all up. The hazel coppice came from my back garden. So we literally lifted five huge big um, coppiced hazels from the back of our garden. It was a late spring, so you can see they're only just coming into leaf. And I wanted it to be really leafy and looking shady and everything else. And you start looking at things and thinking, 
come on, nature, for heaven's sake, just play ball for once. Um, because, you know, you sort of think, no, it's got to be the impression of shade. I don't need it to have sun leaves on it to give it a lovely shade. It's surprising how, you know, they go in about 15 days before the show opens. And in that two weeks, the temperature rises. You get a bit more sunlight. The leaves start to open up really quite quickly. So it's really quite good. And you can see plant material gets taken up there. It's all tidied up. We're very lucky because with us being the people who were growing it, we were doing it peat free. So we're trying um, and we're also insecticide free as well. So it's all very ecological from that point of view. The plant material is, is brought up in batches that we can use daily and then we don't have to worry about storing stuff and keeping it, although we had a reasonable amount of room. Um, and we were just then planting it through and it's all material that is woodland material. So you've got anthriscus, so cow parsley, you've got violas. Okay, so these are a garden variety, but it's still the same idea. You've got gallium odoratum, so that's your sweet woodruff. So you can see now in the bottom corner, you've got a lady there doing some planting and it, it, it you can see it's filling up with the planting and the planting is done from the back coming out so that you don't have to worry we had a little pathway going through that no one could see but we could get down so that we could manage things and get through and that's the art of the planting that you hide those pathways but they're perfectly easy to get down when you know where they are and then you come right down into the bottom corner here on the right hand corner and you see this multi-stemmed that is the apple tree um, then we had these gabions and to give you some scale there's me inside one of them the boys were filling up all of my gravel area so we had oh something like 34 tons of spent flint stone that was put into the actual gabions. It was washed here by hand. And a gentleman who did other washing says, do you know how many flints it takes to fill one of these black ton bags? I said, Michael, I do not want to know. You haven't seriously counted every single flint as you've washed it. So yes, of course I have. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an army person. I count everything, make sure that I've got everything going in. But we had to wash them before they went up there because they were flints that I had got from somebody who did napping. But these were all the ones that he didn't want anymore. They were ones that weren't going to be of any use. So we had some that had already been napped and some that were um, just field collected. And we needed to make sure that they were clean because we didn't need, if it got wet for you know, mud to come off and we wanted the river area to be clean as well. And then we got a load of flint gravel as well. So we've got the difference between everything to make it all look slightly different. They were different heights. They were different shapes and sizes just to give you a bit of jeopardy, different areas. And we would then put a few of our leftover shells as I'd like to call them, and put them on top. And then in the centers of those, we put pure chalk so that we actually had some chalk there as well. So we had the whole thing all knitted in together. And you can just see how, as you come down through those stepping stones, you can't stand on the ones which have got the chalk. So you have to make a serious decision. Are you taking a big step one way, coming off and going through and coming out? Of different... That was the idea of the Jeopardy coming through. And that's the same idea of Jeopardy that we have with the chalk streams. So we went, we decided that we would do the stream as just a nice flat layer, just slowly going down with lovely flint gravel in the bottom of it. We would use some willow woven sides, which we use on the uh, down on the river here. They are willow or they're hazel, depending on what they've got, to be able to direct the river out and then fill in behind so that you can increase the flow or restrict it, depending on what you want to do. So I was trying to keep it as much as possible. And then down in the bottom corner, you can see when we first put some water in and the water is just flowing over, what is the spring going down into the beautiful clear water and we did manage to put a little bit of ranunculus in there as well so we had to, and it actually flowered which was amazing it was a messy job we ended up in wetsuits and everything else everybody had fun planting we had so many people coming and really enjoying themselves understanding what I was trying to do 
and very, very pleased with what it did and how it highlighted what you can do. And then the two bottom pictures is something that no one would ever see. These were taken from the top of the actual wall, looking down over the garden itself. So you could see that beautiful water going off. And this is just a closer view. So you can see at the moment the water is cloudy. This is when we've realised we have a slight problem. Um, and there isn't a lot of water, as you can see, in what should be the main stream. Because basically, instead of it going towards the people with the high-vis jackets on, it's coming towards us and going in the wrong direction. But you can see what I was trying to do with the effect and everything else. And then when the covering was taken off the pathway, we had this beautiful colored path that went all the way through. You have the white representing the chalk, you have the yellow representing the sun, you have the blue representing the water, you have the green representing foliage, and the purple is for everything else that you want to have in the way of colours. And it did its point. This is an overview looking down over it, so you can see the silver lines, as I said right at the beginning, that interwoven silver line going through everything goes up through the pathway. It connects to the silver aluminium of the coccolithosphere, the silver of the bark of the actual alders, and then just coming down through all of the planting. Lovely heavy planting, thick planting going into sparse planting because there isn't the water at the end where that is. And this, you know, you can look down it, you can see there's a play on colour, there's a play on shapes, um, utilising all sorts of different plant material. These are all plants people would have in their gardens, they're things we grow here at the nursery. Right at the end there, you will see another little wall. Now, initially, it was only the short bit where the gabion is. Unfortunately, our neighbour wanted their wall to go right the way along to the end. And we had to, at last minute, do something about that. And so what we did was we got a grid and we painted um, the wall a soft color and then put a mosaic of tiles going over. So we didn't have the flints, we just had the brick going over the top. Again, still in the same shape of the river or the pathway or parts of it, and just to keep the continuity of everything going through. So you can imagine if you'd been walking through it, you'd have gone through a beautiful garden going up into the shade, coming around some damp plants, looking down over the river, thinking, oh, great. And then there would be a bridge over the end of the waterway, and then suddenly it gets dry. The bridge and the path stop. Then you go on to the stepping stones of what do we do next? If we carry on, you're just going to fall off a cliff. Otherwise, you've got the stepping stones. We've got to do something. We've got to make it happen. We've got to make these things go. So you can see the clear water there. You can see it coming through. And now as you come out of the garden, you come right to the end, you can see how it has become drier. It has become sparse at planting. You've got the one tree. You've got these stepping stones. You've got a bit of thyme. You've got a bit of grass. You've got a few willows. You've got a few sparse seedlings. That is all that is going to be able to self-seed and keep going if we carry on extracting, 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 and we don't get our normal rainfall. We didn't get our normal rainfall this year. And although it's raining now, we've not had enough yet. And I do our rain gauge and we're still on a dry year. It is something people have to understand. I mean, I love plants and I love people to enjoy their plants and be able to put as much colour in there as possible. As the more diversity of plant life we have, the better all of our lives will be. But you've also got to have water to keep that diversity of plant life going and therefore keeping our insects going, keeping our bird life going, keeping our invertebrates going. And it all ties in, everything ties in to this idea that you must keep it going. So ignore the fact of the beautiful area, which was all fully planted. You've got to the end of the bridge and you are now on 
just a small bit of almost desert gravel, bare, dry river bed. And I have to say, unfortunately, there are about 40 or 50 chalk streams that this has happened to. And if they don't get resurrected, they will stay like that. You know, the lark and the linnet are being looked after now, but it may be too late unless they can get some more help and get things done. Up in the back there, the hedgerows, you can see our native plants. You know, they're trying to keep going. It paints a sorry picture, doesn't it? You know, it, this idea that that's what we're going to have. We're going to have much more Mediterranean. The trouble is we aren't Mediterranean. So although people think that Mediterranean planting is going to be the way forward, Mediterranean plants are not going to like our winters. We are an island with a completely different winter to what happens on mainland Europe. And that is why a lot of people struggle. Their Mediterranean plants do brilliantly through the summer. Come the winter, they die. Why? Because we have alternating temperatures, either high or really low, really wet, really dry. We are not constant. And that's why Mediterranean plants don't like us through the winter. So we're going to have to look at the different things that we can do. Plus, we've got to be careful in what we actually do with the plants. So this was the end of the garden. A few patches of grass where maybe there could have been a little bit more, somewhere where the seed has gone. A few scraggy little Acer compestries, because they are native, they will keep going whatever happens. Things that have got deep roots will last. Things that can seed, grow quickly, die, set seed again. All of those things will grow quite well in what is this type of environment. But we don't really want that. And if you take the right path, through here, you can get back up onto the area of good. If you take the wrong path, you end up in the dry. And what was quite interesting is that I was there all the time when people were visiting and we got a lot of people coming up and I got a lot of geologists coming to us and going, you have got this so right. And I found that really good for me that I'd done my research correctly and that they were able to understand exactly what I was trying to say. RHS judges didn't understand it, but that's got nothing to do with it. I did have one person come up to me from um, a certain programme, and I'm not going to say who, and he just sort of said to me, says, well, what are you going to do about the situation? And I was absolutely gobsmacked. And he disappeared off. And I thought, well, actually, I have done something. I've actually put this garden up to tell you exactly what I'm going to do. But anyway, I was very upset. There you go. Dry, a few seed heads, few natives. And that is what you're going to get. So what can we do? Where do we go from the point of view of our own gardens? What do we think about? What, what are we going to do? You can do things like this. You can allow self-seeders. You can have gravel gardens. They will all work really, really well. Um, you can utilize plant material that doesn't need as much water as other things. Um, the beauty of a gravel garden, people think gravel gardens are just for plants that like the dry. Well, that's not actually true. Gravel holds moisture and it holds moisture for the plants to be able to get. And it means that the plant's roots are cooler. So even if it's a gravel garden in full sun, it is always cool underneath the gravel. So therefore, the soil doesn't evaporate as much as if it is just pure soil. So these are things that people have to understand. You, we may have to change the way that we garden slightly. What we choose in the way of plant material is key. So something that some seeds, for instance, Verbena bonariensis, on the edge of a lawn, I mean, lawns may be something that we have to think about getting rid of. We don't want to be watering them. You know, they're, they're a monocrop at the end of the day. This verbena bonariensis loves this gravel. I, I really am jealous of this lot of verbena bonariensis. I have a gravel garden here at the nursery and I cannot get verbena bonariensis to self-seed around all over the place. So if anybody else is out there and can't get it to self-seed, then I can't either. So that's fine. I have to plant it every single year. There are other people who can't get a ridger and carvinsky to self-seed. That I can manage. But 
self seeders are good. They will help. They will grow where they want to grow. They will grow in the drier areas and, and that sort of thing. So this is something people have to think about more often. You know, this idea of the neat and tidy garden may be something of the past. We all have to learn to garden with plant material that actually works, that doesn't require too much water, doesn't require too much feeding, etc. The other thing is, like this, this inula hookeri here, look at that beautiful little hover fly that is on there we need to be planting plants for pollinators we need to be planting for a diversity of insects i'm going to upset a few people here we grow all sorts of plants here on the nursery from single flowered to double flowered you will hear on gardening programs, don't plant double flowered plants because the bees cannot get into them. Well, it's not all about the bees. Yeah? Bees are a monoculture. They are an agricultural crop. They are kept for us to have honey. They ravage plant material and they chase out solitary bees and everything else. Now, I'm not against honeybees per se, but they are not the be all and end all. Sorry about the pun. We need everything else. Double flowers have pollen. Double flowers have nectar. And they are a hiding place for other small insects. And they are very, very good. There are double flowering plants in nature, not just ones that have been bred. So they are there for a reason. So you need to have everything. You need diversity. And that is what we need in our gardens. We do not want just rose gardens. We do not want just lavender hedges. I'm sorry, people have got to get out of this idea of the monoculture that exists. This is one of the reasons why you get rose sick planting sickness, because you keep on putting in the same plants over and over again. A garden needs rotation. One planting scheme can't stay there forever. You need to rotate, otherwise it's exactly the same in nature. Plants die, there's a reason. Yeah, they, they've come to the end of their life. Something else comes into their place, which is a different species. That then is a home and a haven for something else. And that's what we need. Diversity everywhere, even if it's just a small change. And hoverflies are one of the best pollinators we have. Yeah, there are something like 27 different species of, of hoverfly in this country and they range from being tiny minute little things with little yellow and black stripes to quite large ones and we need all of those yeah we need the wasps we need the ants okay some people may not like them in the garden but we need everything and we need a diversity and if we can have wild areas where they can thrive then we will have a much better ecosystem going on and going through so, so that's my bit there is nothing wrong per se with the honeybee we do have hives here at the nursery there are four i won't let them have too many more than that that's enough they are not what you want to be having in the garden what you want are the solitary bees the ones that are living in the wood the ones that are in the ground those are the ones you want the normal honeybee will wipe out all of the food for the solitary bees so you've got to be very very careful and have a good equilibrium of both of those together Planting things that are species, that are native to our areas, is also key. You don't have to have a lot of them. So something like Pulsatilla vulgaris used to be naturally on chalk downland everywhere in this county and across all of the chalk downlands, Sussex, Wiltshire, everywhere. Pulsatilla vulgaris in the wild is virtually non-existent now. It is something that is being replanted. People are putting it back. You can go and get the other colors. There is no problem with that. That is not a problem, but they are something which is native to us and they will grow really, really well. So think about plants that should be here and are, there are 
garden worthy ones that you can put in the garden or have an area which is wild pastor Tilla vulgaris loves our chocolate you know it's wonderful and the you know it is a brilliant pollinator plant it looks fabulous in bud looks fabulous in flower and when it goes over it's got those amazing seed heads so it looks really really good so that is something that you should think about looking at getting primulas we're in primrose county in hampshire you know they're everywhere all over the place so maybe you don't want to have the common primula, you know, primula vulgaris like this one, but you could have something like this, primula guinevere, which has purple foliage and it has these beautiful pink flowers. They will grow in the same areas. You know, you're finding a plant which has been bred that isn't too far off what is the native and putting it into your garden to give an effect in your garden because it will survive. If they are as near to the species as possible, they will survive much better than things that have been highly bred. Now, it's like having a highly bred or um, dog or cat or, or horse, you know, the higher bred they are, the more they need looking after. It's exactly the same with plants. The more highly bred they are, the more you need to look after them. And to be honest, to keep things going and looking good in your garden, you want them to not need as much attention. So that is the reason why you want to be looking at this type of plant material. Gium rivali, this is our native water avens. This will be down on the test. There'll be places where, the, where this is there. This is a brilliant plant. You know, it's really, really useful. It's got all, you can always tell it because it's got these lovely nodding heads and it makes a lovely clump and it, it is a super plant. But again, you may not necessarily want the straight species. That's absolutely fine. But you can go for something that's been bred from the species. And this is GM Bell Bank. And it is a lovely garden plant, but it's still going to grow because it's not too far away from the original to be something that's going to grow in the same conditions. And so it's looking at plants that are useful and easy to grow and will be quite happy growing in the conditions that we've got. And that's where we've got to look. And I have to say a lot on the nursery recently, I've been getting a lot more species plants and trying to get species and then things that are nearer that, because I know they can cope with the condition, changing conditions that we have year in year. So you've got your gravel gardens, you can uh, mix and match, you can either have them quite grey or you can change and you don't plant too close because if you don't plant too close, they haven't got too much competition, therefore they get a bit more of the available water, they get a bit more of the available food that is in the ground there and actually you get to see the beauty of the whole of the plant that is there if you do it in that sort of way. I have a gravel garden, so if you haven't been up to the nursery and you don't know what my garden is like, you don't want to see my, well, you might want to see my back garden. My back garden is wild, basically. It's a hayfield normally with orchids and other things that have grown in there. And I just encourage the nettles and everything. I have a daisies, I have buttercups, I have dandelions, the lot, because I want as much wildlife in my back garden as possible. Front garden is this, it's a gravel garden, which is allowed to self seed. And then I edit it. So when I've got too much of something, it just gets pulled out. And then there might be a space, space for a year. And then suddenly something else fills that space because it's self-seeded into there. So that is the way that I do that. That never, ever gets any artificial watering. Even this year in this drought, that's never had any extra water because it's got enough. The roots are down. They're not overcrowded and they've, they've had the water thing. But that is full south. So it gets really, really hot. Lots of people want to have the photograph on the right here with lots of plant material looking really good. When you choose the right material and you make sure that you utilize mulch and you, you, you prune them back at the right time, they will grow and you can have good looking borders um, that will survive perfectly well, again, without watering. That just happens to be one of the bits down at Spring Pond. Um, and, you know, she doesn't water the garden either, but it does get well mulched. So that makes a difference. So we've got to remember to do all of these things. We've got to be able to utilize what we're doing. So we went from this beautiful 
full on planting with the beautiful clear chalk stream there to that dry area, we've got to get a midway. This is what that beautiful full planting was like. It was all stuff that had lovely fullness and good shapes and colours. Um, you know, the, the typical English style of planting. And that's what people aspire to. But you've got to look after it. So you've got to mulch it, you've got to split it, you've got to choose the correct material to be able to cope with what happens if we don't get enough rain. And just to finish it off at the front, I thought, well, everybody else puts posts and ropes up. I thought, no way. We are going to have hazel posts and we're going to have willow woven round and just have it so that it looks absolutely key on. But you can see, even in the gravel bit there, there are plants that like to be in that sort of area. So grey leafed things, low growing things, you can still get a little bit of colour and, and plants that enjoy looking through. You get beautiful sunlight coming through and that's what happened with the garden that we had there at Chelsea. And this was the team or some of the team and that's what it's all about at the end. You have a good drink and you just cheer it all on. So what are the practical actions? Because I haven't really touched on this and I will just do a little bit. I would like to see us reducing or stopping using hose pipes always. You know, people will think, what earth are you talking about? A hose pipe, yes, if you've got a stop on it and you can fill up a bucket or you can fill up a watering can, but do not water your garden with a hose pipe. It is the most inefficient way of watering your plants. Use buckets and watering cans and take the rows off the watering can. That is useless when you're watering the garden because all it does is exactly the same as if you got it on a hose and you're just spraying it everywhere. You should be doing directional watering. Use a bucket and a watering can. So take your bucket, take your watering can, forget your rose, and then pour the water at the base of the plant and give it a full can. Then fill up your watering can again with a bucket and do it that way, or use the bucket straight over the top, filling up a hole if you're doing your planting. If you're planting plants into the ground, dig out the hole, put a bucket of water in, wait for it to go down, put the plant in, cover up, do not water anymore. It has to find the water that has gone down. The roots will follow the water. If you water at the top, the roots stay at the top. You need the water to go down. I've put stop washing cars. I can't see the point in washing a car. How much water gets wasted washing blooming cars? OK, if you have to, use a bucket of water. Do not use the hose pipe. Yes, at this time of year, you've got to clean your lights. You've got to clean your number plates. What else do you need to clean? Wait until the winter's over and then give the bottom a good clean. Doesn't need it every blooming weekend. Collecting your rainwater. I'm not, I'm not going into it. There are so many different ways of collecting rainwater, but you can find out about it. Water butts, absolutely brilliant. Using that water, it's great. Grey water, again. So we do our washing up in a bowl. Now, at the end of the bowl, you will always get some solid pieces and what have you. Do not want those in the garden because that can encourage rats. It can encourage your dogs or your cats to come in and eat it. So if you're going to use that water, use a sieve or something to get those bits out and you can put those into the bin or you can put them into the compost heap. The grey water is then usable to be able to water everywhere else. That is a good way of doing it. But just remember to filter your grey water before you use it. Again, you will find lots of people who will give you ideas on what to do with that. The other thing that's very key is planting plants at the correct time of year. If it flowers in the spring, plant it in the autumn. If it flowers in the autumn, plant it in the spring, because they are then going to actively grow when you put them in. Planting in the autumn is brilliant because it is becoming moist. The soil is warm. So things will get away and grow really, really well. So autumn planting is great. Spring planting is good as well. Now, 
I'm doing myself out of a service here because we sell plants in containers all year round. But what I do say to people is if we have a really dry spell, you've got to look after those plants. I wouldn't suggest planting them until you get a good amount of water and make sure you're looking after them properly. That's the key thing. The French don't do any gardening from June through to the end of August. They sit out there and enjoy it with their wine and their cheese. Yeah, they've probably got something right there. Growing more plants that are tolerant to our climate. So that means using more species plants or related to the species that grow in this country. Forget about the, you know, the yuccas and there. In some places, yes, they'll grow. But the thing is, people think, oh, great, we're getting dry. We can have Mediterranean plants. No, they need more attention. And quite often, they are the things that need more water because their roots are not going in the right place. Their roots are used to being maybe on the surface and getting dew. Our plants go down. Think about what you're going to plan to do. And the other last one there is don't tidy up your gardens too much. Yeah, that makes everybody's life easier. From that point of view, leaving the deadheads, leaving the top growth there. The more you leave it there, the better it is for the wildlife. It's called spring cleaning for a reason. You do it in the spring. When you go out to your plant material in the spring, you hardly ever have to use a pair of secateurs or snips to cut it back because all you have to do is grab it and it all comes off naturally. And the plants have taken out of any of that material all of the nutrients that they require. If they have left their leaves and their leaves have dropped onto the ground, you will probably find there are no leaves left because the worms have taken them down and they have utilized them. So it is far better if you leave it all there and tidy up in the spring. So there we go. Chalk streams are our rainforests. We need to preserve them, restore them and strengthen them for the future. Thank you very much for listening.